Alzheimer's disease, um, a new condition actually. Until the 20th century, it was unknown. The first case was recorded in 1907 in the form of a case report. It was done. They're one off? Okay. All right, so we gotta go back. Yeah, I know, but they, there we go. Okay, thank you, sorry about that. Um, for some reason, that's, this doesn't work as well, so I'll try to be mindful about that. But anyway, um, the first case was published as a case report by a psychiatrist. His name was Alzheimer, and that's where the condition got its name. Um, the patient was a 50-year-old patient, really young when you think about it, who suffered from paranoid behavior and emotional outbursts and appeared to be incredibly confused. He had no understanding of time or place and had completely lost all short-term memory. So, memory problems had actually been described by the ancient Greeks, but what was particularly interesting about this particular patient was nobody had ever reported these kinds of problems in a relatively young person. On autopsy, Alzheimer made another interesting discovery, which was amyloid plaques. Um, these are abnormal proteins that aggregate outside the brain cells, and tau tangles, which are twisted protein fibers that cut off the supply of nutrients to the cells. So, um, there's no reference to the disease before in any textbooks or medical journals. So this begs the question, is Alzheimer's disease a new disease that is occurring because people are living longer? Is it um, something that's changed in our genetic profile? Uh, or has it always been around and we're just getting better at diagnosing it? Those are all good questions to ask. So let's address the lifespan issue. If you look at the data, we're only living about three months to three years longer than we used to. So what we have is a statistical situation that makes it look like we're living longer. So here's what I mean by this. We have successfully reduced the rate, not enough, but significantly, of infant mortality in our country. So if fewer people are dying at the age of two hours or three days or three months, what happens is the average age at mortality automatically gets pushed upward. So it's important to re realize that we're really not living all that much longer than we used to. Now, let's look at incidence. Is it possible that this was missed? Lots of people had Alzheimer's disease and we just didn't know it. Well, US Census data for 1900 showed that there were 3.2 million people in the United States who were over the age of 60. So based on today's incidence rate, this means that there should have been 36,300 cases of Alzheimer's disease in the United States at the turn of the century, but not a single one was reported. Now, I can understand if it wasn't reported in a medical journal, but it has never been reported anywhere. And I would think that if the people were regularly like walking out the front door and disappearing into the plains never to be seen again, this would have at least made a good newspaper story once in a while. Absolutely nothing. So I don't think it's that it's always been there and we weren't diagnosing it. We see the same phenomenon in other countries too. Just no, no report of anything like this. Um, another clue that there's something else going on here is that Alzheimer's disease is concentrated geographically in westernized countries. So you see a lot of it here. You don't see so much of it in some Asian countries and in South America and Africa. So genes, we'll talk about genes specifically, aren't the cause. Diagnostic skill doesn't account for it. We're not living longer. So what is going on? Well, I can tell you one thing that's going on is that Americans are really worried about this. According to a report that was recently published, 34% of adults rated their memory that saying that it is as, as good now as it is, was when they were younger. But 59% reported the opposite. Their memory was worse. 7% said much worse. 48% said, I'm likely to develop dementia. Think about that. If half the people in the country at a given point in time had dementia, 73% said they were trying at least one thing to reduce the risk. And only 5% discussed ways to reduce the risk with their doctor. Probably good because most doctors don't know what to do to reduce the risk. Now, one thing to be clear about, there are lots of causes of cognitive decline, and only one of them is Alzheimer's, but in the interest of time, we're gonna focus on Alzheimer's disease. So, we're gonna look at the four major contributors to Alzheimer's disease, and then how lifestyle habits cause these kinds of things. So the first thing is inflammation. Now, first of all, inflammation is a natural process of the body. It's your immune system responding to invading threats. Acute inflammation is redness and swelling at an injury site, which promotes healing. 
but chronic inflammation that's unrelenting is due to things like diet, stress, and bad lifestyle choices. The tissues are damaged instead of healed. And early in the process of Alzheimer's disease, in this time period when you don't know that anything's going on because you're not experiencing any discomfort, inflammation in the brain develops. And the cells that are responsible for housekeeping, collecting the garbage and discarding it in the brain, they become overwhelmed and what you end up with is cell death and structural damage. So chronic inflammation, and we'll look at what contributes to that, is a major factor. Another factor is oxidation, which occurs naturally when oxygen reacts with other substances. So a good example would be you chop up some lettuce, leave it on the counter, and it turns brown. That's oxidation. This results in the formation of free radicals, which steal electrons from neighboring tissues and cells. In the brain, free radicals take uh, electrons from neurons and organelles and proteins and lipids and fatty acids and DNA, uh, results in permanent damage. The brain uses most of the body's oxygen, so it's very vulnerable to oxidative reactions. The brain can address oxidation, it's designed to do it, but the problem is the brain becomes overwhelmed. And by the way, one of the things that I'll stress here is all of the parts of your body have enormous self-healing capacity, but that's assuming that you take good care enough of yourself that that, that whole system isn't disabled by being completely overwhelmed. Okay, so next one. Glucose dysregulation which is very common in the early stage of the disease. So glucose feeds the brain cells, and the development of insulin resistance causes high plasma glucose levels to build up. This results in inflammation and oxidation, which we just talked about, dysregulation of lipids and tau phosphorylation leading to tangles. The more glucose dysregulation, the more pronounced it begets, the, uh, that it gets, the higher the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Diabetics experience more shrinking in the hippocampus or the memory center than other people and are therefore like, more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And one thing that I'll mention, type 2 diabetes is one of the most preventable and treatable diseases that people in our culture develop. And it not only increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease significantly, it increases the risk of cancer significantly, which is why we should be paying a lot of attention to this particular issue. And then lipid dysregulation. Lipids are building blocks of cells and hormones and steroids, and they comprise 59% of the brain's dry weight. But high lipid levels lead to inflammation and oxidative damage, which are harmful byproducts. Cholesterol is a lipid that accumulates in the blood vessels and damages them, and therefore vascular disease is a big risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And you'll hear me say many, many times uh, throughout this lecture and in other lectures related to the topic, what's good for the brain and the cardiovascular, what is good for the brain is good for the cardiovascular system. What's good for the cardiovascular system is good for the brain. So if you eat a heart-healthy diet, you're going to go a long way in protecting your brain from damage. The inability to clear cholesterol and lipids leads to the accumulation of amyloid plaques in the brain. And the most, most vulnerable people are people who have a particular gene mutation that we're going to talk, to talk about in just a couple of minutes. Um, however, that doesn't mean that there's no hope or there's nothing they can do about it. Genes are not a um, life sentence. They're just a predisposition. So, one thing to make clear, Alzheimer's disease is not an inevitable consequence of getting older. It's a process of degeneration. And the reason that it doesn't take place or it doesn't develop until you get older is because it takes a long time to injure yourself to the place where the symptoms become really evident. So let's talk about genetic predisposition. So over 20 genes have been discovered that have some relationship to Alzheimer's disease. And the one that's the most important that we're going to talk about for a second here is APOE. It's a gene on chromosome 19, and it's involved in the production of apolipoprotein E. It carries fat and cholesterol throughout the body, repairs brain cells, and builds synapses. Now, each gene has two alleles. You get one from your mom, and you get one from your dad. And in the case of the alleles that go with this gene, E2 reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but it increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. E3, no increased risk, but the E4 allele is a problem. If the allele is from both parents, it's really a problem. Three times greater risk um, if it's from one parent, 10 to 15 times greater risk if it is from both parents. However, the important thing to point out about genetics is you can have 
a terrible genetic profile where, and I do, by the way, lots of diseases run in my family that I don't want to get. I don't have them, so I have used diet and lifestyle to overcome my genetic history, all right, predisposition. Now, on the other hand, you could have a great genetic profile. Everybody in your family lives to be 110 years old, and nobody develops cancer or heart disease or any of those kinds of things, and you can overwrite that with misbehavior. So the question is, which are you going to do? So I'll give you an example of the different outcomes here. The Honolulu Asian Aging Study looked at Japanese people living in the United States and compared to, to Japanese people living in Japan. And of course, there wasn't much genetic difference between the groups, but there was an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease in the American population because of diet, exercise, and lifestyle habits. Um, in China, we see the world's, unfortunately, largest diabetic population, and what we have seen is that the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, which was unheard of in China just a few years ago, has been increasing exactly at the same rate as the incidence of diabetes. So the Chinese people are not predisposed to develop Alzheimer's disease. They're inducing this increasing incidence by adopting Western habits. So you're not stuck with your, with your genes. Okay, so having said this, we look at the, the four main influences and let's take a look at um, the specific things that lead to and can lead away from developing Alzheimer's disease. So the first thing is sleep. People who do not get enough sleep and I'm not talking about sleep deprived for a night, I'm talking about people who just chronically don't sleep or don't sleep well, um, really impair brain function. Because while, your brain, while you're sleeping, your brain is performing, I call it metabolic housekeeping, taking out the trash, strengthening the connections, taking the stuff that you learned today and storing it properly and integrating it with everything that you already know. In fact, we have MRI images now that show information literally being taken from the front of the brain where it comes in and it's like the temporary holding facility and going to the back of the brain where it's kept for permanent storage. Well, that doesn't happen when you're awake. So if you don't sleep well, you increase your risk of developing some type of cognitive dysfunction. Um, executive function is affected by lack of sleep. We even have studies that show that sleep deprivation for a night can make you less sharp. I don't think that shocks anybody. If you had a bad night or stayed up all night because your plane was late or whatever, you're probably not doing your best work at eight o'clock in the morning at your desk. Sleep deprived people actually accumulate more amyloid in their, in their brains. And healthy neurons and connections can be destroyed by lack of sleep. So I think we can say good idea to get sleep every night, enough of it. Another risk factor is obesity. The cardiovascular health study showed that obesity in midlife increased the risk of dementia by 40%. Um, a 2016 study showed that obese patients had less white matter in their brains, which results in slower signaling and processing. And, and so it isn't the obesity itself that's contributing, although obesity increases generalized inflammation, and that is a factor. It's the habits that lead to obesity, being more sedentary, eating more fat, eating, uh, overeating too many calories, et cetera, that contribute to this. So staying lean is a good idea. In fact, um, if you look at pictures of centenarians online, you don't see any that are obese. The, the obese people die off earlier. The centenarians are pretty lean people. Um, I don't think that most people would say that there's any reason to encourage smoking. But here's one more reason to discourage it, and that is that it impairs blood flow and it leads to an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Data from over 7,200 people show that as people age, uh, smokers will have a much more rapid decline in brain function uh, than people who don't smoke. Um, smoking promotes the accumulation of these abnormal proteins in the brain much faster um, than interfere with brain function. Quitting helps, by the way. If you are a smoker and you quit smoking, um, within 10 years, your risk factor will be the same as if you had never smoked. So you're not stuck with that either. All of this is, is fixable. 
Higher insulin levels are a factor. So this isn't surprising based on the data that I showed you about diabetics having a higher risk. Um, people with insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, all of these things that come under the category of metabolic syndrome are at higher risk of vascular dementia, stroke, and Alzheimer's disease. The common denominator, what makes all of these, uh, what, what puts them all in this category is mitochondrial dysfunction. It's exacerbated by age, but um, the changes begin decades before diagnosis. So if you have high blood glucose levels, you have a 35% risk of dementia. If you have glucose levels in the diabetic range, it goes up to 74% increased risk, which is really significant. Now remember what I said about what's good for the cardiovascular system is good for the brain. Coronary artery disease is a major risk factor. Hypertension narrows and blocks arteries. Cholesterol triggers the formation of toxic clusters of amyloid beta protein in the brain. Hypertension in midlife is particularly associated with an increased risk of dementia. AFib is a risk factor. Addressing it either with drugs or some other form of treatment reduces the risk. But when you think about it, if the brain is using so much oxygen and glucose, anything that impairs the delivery of those things to the brain would be a factor, and that's where your cardiovascular system becomes important. Psychological state is an issue. Anxiety and depression increase the production of stress hormones like cortisol, which prunes the synapses. And research, research shows that consistently high levels of cortisol um, cause increased risk of cognitive decline. The severity, and this is important, anytime you see a dose-dependent relationship, this usually strengthens the association. So the severity of the mood disorder, mild depression isn't as harmful as severe depression. Mild anxiety, not as, uh, not as much of a risk factor as severe anxiety. Um, I don't recommend addressing these things with drugs, but I do recommend addressing them because, um, first of all, it leads to a better quality of life, and it will prevent a lot of other bad things from happening, like cognitive decline. Being sedentary is a risk factor. People who spend the most time watching television have the highest risk of Alzheimer's disease, and that's probably somewhat due to the mind-numbing content that is available today. But it's also because the more you sit, the less active you are, the more gray matter you tend to lose. Now here's the big thing, nutrition and cognitive function. So the brain's using 25% of the energy that you're taking in, which makes it particularly vulnerable to bad choices. So what you eat can either promote healthy brain function or it can destroy healthy brain function. So um, good food is the best available resource to preserve brain health. And it's also the thing that you can have somewhat the most control over, you know, is what you put in your mouth every day. Here's the good news. Um, to get the RDA for copper, iron, and uh, zinc, really easy to do by eating a variety of plant foods, or it, it, when I say a variety of plant foods, what I mean is that these things are in a lot of plant foods, because one thing I talk about is people not choking down foods they don't like because they think they need to. And uh, I remember a long time ago when I first started in this business, I was talking to a woman in a follow-up call, and I said, how's it going? She goes, it's all right. I said, well, what's going on? What do you mean you don't sound too happy about it? She said, I'm eating green apples, and I'm eating kale. I said, well, it doesn't sound like you like those foods. She goes, I don't. I said, well, then why are you eating them? She said, well, you know, they're good for you. I said, well what kind of greens do you like? Eat those. I mean, it's, there's no magical food. So when I put these foods up here on the slide, it's not because I think, oh my gosh, if you don't eat, you know, whole grains and mushrooms, you know, you don't like those foods, that's okay. Just eat plant foods and it will be almost impossible not to meet the RDA for these types of nutrients and you won't have any need to take uh, supplements and eat fortified foods. Be very cautious about that. So bottom line to avoid metals, it really points to a plant-based diet. Eat plants, avoid the fortified foods, get rid of the dairy, choose safe cookware, avoid vitamins and supplements, avoid drinking tap water, choose high quality tea if you're gonna drink tea because tea sucks up metals from the soil, so can, tea that's grown in contaminated areas can be a problem. Exercise, I never miss a chance to plug exercise as much as people sometimes don't wanna do it, and donating blood can lower your iron levels as well. Now, dietary fat is a big issue. And yes, you need fat. Sometimes when I talk about fat, people will say, well, don't people need fat? They really do need fat, but it's hard to be fat deficient. In fact, the only people in my office I've ever seen who were fat deficient were people who had serious eating disorders. I don't normally tell people in the office, you know what would help you lose weight? Eat more fat. 
And I never tell people in the office, you know how you could lower your cholesterol, eat more fat, right? We just don't have to give out that advice very often. It's usually the other way around. So I mentioned before that the combination of copper and saturated fat are a problem, and this does increase the damage. And the biggest source of saturated fat in the, in the American diet is dairy. The second is land animals. But saturated fat, even aside from the copper issue, is bad in and of itself. People who ate 25 grams of saturated fat daily had two times the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as people who ate half that. And the same thing was true with trans fat. But here's the problem with trans fat. Everybody knows trans fat is bad for you. So it's been taken out of a lot of foods, most foods actually, because food manufacturers know that people are reading the labels and saying, oh, it has trans fat, I don't want to eat it. The problem is it's being replaced with tropical oils that are full of saturated fat. So we've traded one set of problems for another set of problems. It's kind of like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It really has not been a change for the better. Now, let me show you how easy it is to consume 25 grams of saturated fat. If you had an egg with bacon, one egg, a grilled cheese sandwich at lunch, and a small serving of meat at dinner. There you go, 25 grams. A glass of milk, a serving of salmon, or two pieces of a cheese pizza for dinner, and you've got your 25 grams of saturated fat. So people don't realize how easy it is to consume too much saturated fat. So what does the data tell us about people eating these higher fat diets? Well, a study of 6,000 women, those over 65 years of age who consumed the most saturated fat had the worst cognitive function as compared to the people who were consuming the least. A study of 1,341 adults followed for 21 years, high saturated fat at midlife, midlife, and this was defined as 21.6 grams, less than we talked about in the other study, was associated with worse, worse cognitive skills, worse memory, and increased risk of cognitive impairment. A study of um, 20 cognitively normal adults and 27 with mild cognitive impairment, they were all on the average age 67. Participants with mild cognitive impairment had higher beta amyloid levels than those with normal cognitive function and it was directly related to the saturated fat content of the diet. This is all controllable stuff. So this idea that Alzheimer's disease is genetically predetermined and my father had Alzheimer's disease and my grandfather had Alzheimer's disease, so this is just destined to happen to me, it's not true. We're talking about all these risk factors have nothing to do with genetics. So saturated fat is found in animal foods and animal foods increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease because animal food intake increases the risk of high blood pressure, high triglycerides, high inflammation, and high cholesterol. Um, a study at Loma Linda University with 3,000 participants, those who ate meat, including chicken and fish, two times the risk of developing dementia as those that ate a more plant-based or vegetarian-style diet. 2017 study, participants who ate a plant-based diet had a lower risk of cognitive decline over six years as compared with people who were eating the standard American diet. And the reason was the lower cholesterol and saturated fat content um, in the more plant-based diets. Um, a study of 908 elderly New Yorkers, those who ate the most calories and fat, meaning that just overeating is a risk factor in and of itself, twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And here's what's really interesting. In this and other studies, those who ate fewer bad fats in the diet had a lower risk, even if they had that dreadful E4 allele, which goes back to what I said before. You can have a terrible genetic predisposition in terms of Alzheimer's disease running in your family, and you can overcome that by eating well and taking better care of yourself. And that's a message we need to get out for people because if we don't, people walk around feeling like helpless victims of their genetic predisposition and that's really sad. And kind of making you feel like a victim, right? Cholesterol, plasma cholesterol is a good indicator of your risk. So um, if your cholesterol is 220, um, you have a 25% increased risk, higher, is worse, 250, 50% increased risk. So if you take a look at somebody's plasma cholesterol in midlife, you get a pretty good idea of what their Alzheimer's disease risk is going to be. And I hate to tell you this, but taking statin drugs doesn't fix it. In fact, for the general population who are medicated with statin drugs, except for people who are really high end of cholesterol, they have a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, Statin drugs really don't help people very much. The average risk reduction even for cardiovascular disease is less than 1%. So you can't eat, drink, and be merry, take a statin drug, and stay cognitively sharp. That just doesn't work. 
Um, a study of 9,900 uh, Kaiser patients showed the same thing. 57% increased risk of dementia later on in Alzheimer's disease with high plasma cholesterol levels in midlife. Even borderline increases your risk. So you don't have to be like way off the charts in terms of high cholesterol uh, to have a higher risk. And so just a little bit of science geekiness here. Um, that APOE gene makes a protein that transport cholesterol, transports cholesterol, including cholesterol in the brain. So people who have the dreaded E4 allele absorb cholesterol more easily and have higher cholesterol levels. And then this increases the risk of, or the production of beta amyloid, which is a component of the plaques. And there's just a real easy way to deal with this. Don't eat so much cholesterol. You don't find cholesterol in sweet potatoes. You find cholesterol in animal foods. That's where you're gonna find it. And metals will accelerate the process even more. Um, study at Loma Linda, three groups in this study, a vegetarian diet, vegan diet, and the SAD, the standard American diet, and it is SAD. Vegans were one-third less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than those eating the uh, SAD diet. So even within the range of healthier diets, the vegans are better off than the vegetarians, and the vegetarians are better off than the sad diet. So the closer you get, the more plant-based you become, the more you're gonna reduce your risk of not just Alzheimer's disease, but a lot of other things too. Um, eating more fruits and vegetables is helpful. That's not shocking to anybody. But um, it's dose dependent. Eat three to four servings a day and it's better than eating one serving a day. And green and yellow, uh, orange, and, um, orange fruits and vegetables happen to have uh, some of the best protective effect. But all vegetables are good for you. And one thing that's really clear too is the dietary pattern. If you start looking at studies of, um, of people and Alzheimer's disease, the dietary pattern is important. So there's no magical food that you can eat. You say, well, yellow vegetables are good for you. Great, I'll just load up on sweet potatoes and keep eating steak. That won't work either. You really do need to eat a low-fat, high-fiber, plant-based diet because that's what's best for your cardiovascular system and that's what ends up being best for the brain as well. Now, this is interesting. A clinical trial of 124 subjects who had hypertension, so they're at high risk of Alzheimer's disease. Those eating the DASH diet had better memory, better reasoning, planning, problem-solving skills than those eating the standard American diet. And there's another diet called the MIND diet. Um, and it's not a whole lot unlike what we promote. Restricts red meat, butter, margarine, cheese, sugar, salt, fried and fast food, whole grains three times a day, and berries. I mean, essentially just a different version of a plant-based diet. 53% um, reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease. Moderate adherence, 35%. So even if you're just doing better, uh, you get some protection. But high adherence to the MIND diet, um, brain scans and tests showed that the people had the, a brain that was the equivalent of a person seven and a half years younger. So we always think of aging, everything ages, and, and we're all aging, and sooner or later this is gonna be over, darn it, because I'd stick around for 150 more years if I could. But having said that, you can slow down the process, and there's a great big difference between your chronological and your biological age. I'm chronologically 63 years old, I'm biologically a lot younger than that in terms of a lot of things, cognitive function, physical capability, uh, that sort of thing. So the whole, the whole goal in life, I think, is to stay biologically younger than you are chronologically so that you live until you die. And in this country, one of the problems, and Alzheimer's disease is just one example of it, is we live for a while and then we spend an enormous period of time declining. And it's sad to watch. I've had to do this with family members. I watched my own mother decline in this way. And so here's what I want to do. I want to live, and then one day I'm going to teach my classes and give my talks and go to bed and not get up when I'm 105 years old. How many of you want to have that happen? Yeah. Right? Because so many people are developing Alzheimer's disease, I think one of the most dis discouraging things I hear is stuff like, the, if you want to make an investment, one of the leading investments you can make is to invest in memory care centers because there are so many of them. I find that incredibly depressing, right? So, and I show, showed that data earlier about people are really worried about this, like they're afraid that they're gonna end up with dementia. So of course the supplement industry has stepped up and created all of these products and they're big sellers. In fact, um, in, the, in the United States, sales are supposed to hit 5.8 billion by 2023. And I don't think you can watch a news program without seeing a, um, a commercial for at least one supplement that promotes brain health. So 
Um, the real deal on, um, um, on brain health supplements, Global Council on Vitamins, Minerals, and Other Dietary Supplements, looked at all of them. And they basically concluded none of them work. <laughs> okay, that's it. Yeah. So, so if you were thinking, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry, have high cholesterol, and watch TV, and take jellyfish extract, uh, that won't work either. But, but it's not surprising. In other words, what, why does, should this not surprise us? Look at all the risk factors that we've been talking about um, for Alzheimer's disease. Do you really think that there's any pill that you could take that would overcome all of that? I mean, isn't that just impractical to think about on its face? So I wasn't surprised when I saw this. And I would love it if this kind of thing worked because it would make my job so easy. I mean, if all we had to do was dispense supplements, we'd just open the office in the morning and we'd have long line, you know, because it would be the easy fix. We'd have a long line and we'd go out the door and around the block and the whole nine yards and we would just, you know, hand people the supplements and take in the money. We could see 5,000 people a day. It would be great, but it just doesn't work. Other than that, it's a great idea, but it doesn't work, right? So nutrition is important. Supplements are not going to be a substitute. Um, here's something to pay attention to. Intellectual stimulation is really important. And some people develop amyloid plaque in the brain, but they don't end up with Alzheimer's disease. I know somebody like this in Columbus, actually. He died a few years ago, but this guy was a brilliant scientist at Battelle Institute who was overweight and ate a terrible diet. And he died at, I think, 85 of an accident, didn't die of, of health reasons, uh, surprisingly. But the point that I wanted to make is that after he retired from his job at Battelle, he continued to do research and make scientific presentations around the world. And Battelle often hired him to do like contract work and that sort of thing. So he was mentally engaged all the time. And because he spent all of his days thinking about complicated things, it somewhat overcame the bad habits that he had when it came to eating. So this isn't a free pass, like, oh, if you're sitting out there in the audience going, I'm a nuclear physicist, so I can eat crap all day, and I'll still be really sharp. Um, that's not the message I want to portray at all, as much as how important intellectual stimulation is. Important enough that it can overcome bad diet to a certain extent. People can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by just engaging in daily mental activities. And believe it or not, um, some of those online games like Lumosity and uh, Vividity, um, they're not a substitute by themselves. They're not a substitute for doing other things, but they do develop mental strength. And the programs increase in difficulty over time as, um, as you gain the ability to solve problems. So that's one thing that you can have some of your family members do if it seems like they're starting to show a little cognitive decline. Um, being bilingual is protective. Um, memory problems are delayed by an average of five years. And this is another one where there's a dose-dependent effect. If you speak two languages, it's better than one. Three languages, better than two. And using them, I mean, you have to actually speak the languages. You can't just, like, think about it in your head. But, but if you actually do speak the language, yeah, yeah. I remember uh, there was a, a great study done, just as a funny aside, about people getting better at playing basketball um, by thinking about basketball. And then when they played the game again, they were better. And so I had one of my clients was sitting in the office one day and cited that study, actually, because we were talking about changing habits. And he said, yes, I've made a commitment to think about exercise every day. I said, well, <laughs> nice try. <laughs> but not so much, right? OK, keep working. Um, people who continue to work have a lower risk of dementia. And for each additional year of work, the risk of dementia decreases by 3.2%. Now, we can define the definition of work. This doesn't necessarily mean that if you're 80 years old, you have to get up and go in the office every day, although that's what I'm planning to do, because I love what I do. But people get involved in volunteer work. I have a friend who retired last year from a job that she didn't particularly care for, but she's busy all the time doing stuff. And she has a lot of technical skill, and she's helping nonprofits. And you know, so I think the key is you just have to stay engaged in life. You can't just go home and sit down on the porch and watch the world go by, right? And then we're back to exercise. So people who exercise have very different brains from a structural standpoint. Like the hippocampus, which is the key for memory, it's stimulated by exercise, particularly if you increase your heart rate. Out-of-shape people grew new blood vessels in the hippocampus after just 12 weeks of exercise. 
And exercise can reverse age-related shrinkage of the brain. Adults who exercise over three times a week are 40% less likely to develop dementia. People who eat a healthy diet and exercise can reduce their risk by 60%. And again, the benefit is the most significant in people with the dreadful E4 allele. So you can override your genetic risk. And there's a good reason why. We know what, what it is. When you exercise, particularly aerobic exercise, your brain produces a lot of brain-derived neurotropic factor, which um, protects and grows synapses between the cells and, and protects the brain cells and connections. So people who exercise actually are smarter that's why I'm so smart, because I exercise every day. But, but seriously, this is, this is brain building stuff. You know, you, you just, it, humans are meant to move. You know, when you think about it, just to survive, we had to move. Went back in the day. And it wasn't all that long ago, actually. So this idea that you could actually sit down and have food delivered to your chair, I mean, seriously, remember that episode of Friends where, they, where the guys bought those big black chairs and they, they sat in the chair and had pizza delivered next door so that they'd bring it over so they wouldn't have to get up out of their chair? People live like that, okay? That's not good. So anyway, we're built to move and not moving has serious consequences. And, and in addition to, which since Alzheimer's is related to aging, in addition to brain health, the thing that exercise does is it lets you be independent because the biggest reason why people end up in a nursing home is frailty. And it's because they can't go up and down the stairs and bend over and pick something up and you know, they risk falling over on the sidewalk and that kind of thing. So the sooner you start building a strong body, the more likely you are going to be cognitive, cognitively all there and living in your own house when you're 100 years old. Because you can't start when you're 95 and already decrepit, right? Time to start is now. All right. 59 older, older sedentary adults doing aerobic exercise three times a week. They measured their gray matter at six months in the frontal lobe areas, that's memory and attention. White matter was larger in the area that facilitates communication between the left and the right brain. So you can actually grow a bigger, better brain with exercise. Um, a study of 63 subjects with Alzheimer's disease and 56 people without. The subjects had an MRI and then were tested on a treadmill, and their fitness levels were directly correlated with the images of their brains. Okay? There's a direct relationship. Um, under normal circumstances, if you don't do anything, the, the anterior hippocampus will shrink a little bit every year. But if you start an exercise program, just walking three times a week in this study um, showed the shrinking reversed and increasing size in some areas of the brain. So your brain size and your brain function is related to physical activity. And if you've already started degenerating a little bit, you can start to turn it around. I mentioned sleep before. It consolidates memories, and the brain will clear that amyloid plaque while you're sleeping. So um, I can't overemphasize the importance of a good night's sleep. Um, and I'm not talking about, gosh, you, you know, your plane comes in late and you're sleep deprived the next day, but if you're living in a chronic state of sleep deprivation, you could stay lean and you can avoid diabetes and a lot of things can go right if you just eat well. But one thing that will not happen is your brain will not be protected if you don't get enough sleep.